back to Shattering Mist. We're continuing to review the conditions in the Ukraine. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say that the situation in Ukraine, where the Ukrainians have been far too dependent on uh, their government, uh, government pensions, which in America we call Social Security, uh, government uh, health care, uh, Medicare in the United States, uh, government uh, uh, underwriting of um, of essential uh, products. Uh, the United States uh, would spot 75 million Americans now get food stamps. Uh, many get housing assistance. Others get uh, reverse income tax uh, credits. Underwriting the the uh, the cost of their life by government, making it more cheap for people to live. It's a subsidy. Uh, in the uh, Ukraine, it's uh, it's uh, underwriting the cost of uh, of fuel. If the more people re- accept such government handouts, whether they there be for pension plans, medical care, or for uh, underwriting the cost of life, the more people do it, the more dependent they become. And the more dependent they become, the more in debt their country becomes, and the more subject to control they are, to being manipulated, to being fleeced, to being essentially pawns. There is a consequence of all of this. Now, the uh, Standard & Poor's uh, article uh, continues to to read. This is their assessment of the U.K. It says, uh, of the Ukraine, no alternative funding sources have yet been found. We note that Russia suspended the disbursement of $2 billion in January of this year and has delayed the disbursement of the same amount that was expected in February of 2014 in light of political developments in Ukraine. Russia only announced the support of the package in December 2013. Russia is not going to fund them. They are unwilling to accept the terms of the funding by the IMF. And if the IMF does provide another $20 billion after having failed four times to get the uh, Ukraine to comply with the terms of that agreement, then what does it say? What does it, what does it mean? If if the IMF is continuing to negotiate terms and they provide the money and those that they receive the money don't honor the terms, where does that leave us? This uh, Standard & Poor's assessment uh, reads, we expect that alternative financing assistance from the U.S., EU, or IMF to be tied likely to conditions associated with formal IF, IMF lending program, physical consolidations, and increasing in uh, in energy uh, tariffs. Uh, fiscal consolidation means huge constraints on the amount of indulgences of entitlements that government is uh, is offering. Should the current leadership fall, which it has now fallen, as a result of the political conflict engulfing the country, we have little visibility of what a new government might follow in terms of a policy priority. The opposition protesters appear to be less cohesive than the opposition movement during the Orange Revolution back in 2004 and 2005, and there is no obvious leader. But, you know, the European Union statement that we heard read during the commercial break of we're, uh, we're all in favor of united Ukraine, well, Ukraine is, uh, is going to split apart. There's uh, a huge percentage of Ukrainians who are Russian who want to stay culturally tied to Russia. In fact, here's a, uh, a story on it. It was uh, uh, published by uh, CNN. It says the turmoil in Ukraine has swept aside its president but has brought about a release of, uh, of prominent opposition leaders, but it has raised fears that the country could break apart. After the bloodshed in the streets of Kiev last week, the deadliest violence in the Ukraine has suffered since the Orange Revolution just 22 years ago. Political twists and turns came thick and fast over the weekend. Well, here's the problem. The majority of Ukrainians don't support the coup. And who's in charge? Depends on who you ask. Yankelovich claims that he's still in charge. He says, I don't plan to leave the country. I don't plan to resign. And yet the parliament voted to oust him, even though he was uh, popularly elected. You know, they say that, uh, you know, he's not staying at one of his uh, lavish residences, which the people plowed through and explored. But, you know, if you're an American, you think about somebody like Obama. 
who's never worked an honest day in his life, has never once earned a paycheck from a business. And he's uh, flying Air Force One wherever he wants to go, particularly on vacation. You know, goes out to the Annenberg Estate, has a grand old time while it's snowing in uh, Washington. Takes his uh, vacations in Hawaii at lavish estates. Has his every meal catered, every whim catered in the White House. And you think that's less lavish than what's being experienced in the Ukraine? A lot of people think that the um, that the Ukraine is just going to split apart. The Eastern Ukraine feel that their cultural identity is under threat, with the pro-European side uh, trying to uh, take power in the coup in Kiev. This quote from uh, from a Ukrainian it says, "I think the divide goes very very deep. It's regional, it's linguistic, it's religious." New York Times columnist uh, uh, Nicholas Kristof whose father grew up in the Ukraine, told uh, CNN. Russia's ambassador to the United, Sta- to, uh, the United Nations, uh, Vitaly uh, Kirkin, condemned what he called Western countries' attempts to influence the outcome in the Ukraine. And we did. You know, we have the uh, Undersecretary of State of the United States saying, F, the European Union, and encourage the Ukrainians to revolt in this way. That the United States was with them. Well, who's going to support them now? Now that they bit off the only hand willing to provide them with more debt, what now? The problem is enormous. Absolutely enormous. And it's one that the Ukrainians themselves have made. And no one seems to be thinking through the consequence of their actions. Here's a review of their debt. The total direct and guaranteed debt yeah, you know, by the really Ukraine is, uh, by the end of 2013, will exceed 40%. And that it will reach 48% by the end of next year, according to Fitch ratings. The total ratio of debt to GDP is expected to grow very fast because of the fiscal deficit. Now, think of that in comparison to the United States. Here it is. Uh, under 40% currently, expected to grow to 40% at the end of, uh, of this year and uh, 48% next year. Even at the end of next year, it will be less than half of what we're experiencing in the United States. And yet, the Ukraine is bankrupt because they can't service their debt. What do you think, Glenn? Is there a solution here or do we just have uh, two evils? Well, there's just uh, so definitely multiple evils. Um, you were talking about um, Obama flying around, uh, you know, splurging, wasting money. Um, right. I always think back the best Truman thing for her own secretary. <laughs> Contrast yes. that with what goes on today. Yeah. Um, first of all, the European Union. Uh, yeah, well, 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 no. First of all, the. Uh, the irrational molestation fund has no intention of getting its monopoly money back. It, it doesn't mm-hmm. want to be paid back any more than your bank wants you to, wants you to pay off your credit card. Right. Right. What they want is eternal control. Right. They want to go after commodities, land right. rights, mineral rights, water, agricultural productivity, and the labor of the citizenry forever. That's the that, idea. Yeah, but that's, that's my, but, but that's my point is that yeah. when the people in countries like the United States – uh, except Social Security, uh, which is a Ponzi scheme, is Medicare and, and Medicaid, which are Ponzi schemes, uh, irrational schemes, really. And when they accept food stamps and government housing uh, allowances, and when they uh, embrace welfare and uh, uh, income tax credits, when they do these kinds of things, that what they're doing is selling themselves out. They are making themselves dependent on uh, the uh, the financial power brokers who are going to control them. Yeah. I mean, that's but just the, the ultimate bottom line, line is here. Foolish. That is foolish of them, but even more so, you, you know, there's nothing more foolish than a parasite that kills its host. And, yes. you know, man, <laughs> there's no go. limitations, you know. Right. And so, you know, they, we've seen before that these sociopaths are willing to kill the, the goose that lays the golden egg, you yeah. know. And, I, and but, you know, as somebody who, who did work for a living, I, I, I tell you that I am bothered that uh, that America has become uh, so parasitic. It is it is bothersome to me because of what it does to my children's future. You know, I'm going to make it through my life without seeing the country completely collapse 
but it's going to be, you know, its collapse is uh, is imminent. And and it's the parasitic approach that has uh, pushed the country to this position, just as it did with the uh, UK. But what's so sad is the people who are the parasites are literally uh, sapping the life out of uh, their future. Uh, they're, they're putting themselves in a position where they will be manipulated and controlled, no different than were the, uh, the serfs uh, during uh, feudal Europe. They've sold themselves right. into slavery. Right, right. And it's, yeah, and it's, it's quite self-destructive and quite faint. But, you know, we're going to wonder, you know, one has to wonder, you know, how in the world did Hasatan, you know, seeing the glory of heaven himself, I right. you know, <laughs> managed to do what he did to himself, you know, having having perceived the glory of God You're right. in heavenly places. We haven't, well, I think one of the reasons we have a potential for receiving mercy is because we don't know, you know, forgive them, Father, they know not yeah. what they do. Right. And, we're, we're yeah. in, in our ignorance, God shows us mercy. But, uh, you know, the, 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 um, I wanted to yeah. get back to Ukraine. A bit. Most most people, we know nothing of the Ukraine in the U.S. You know right. that uh, we've maybe seen some folk dancers with pretty dresses and and right. uh, some painted eggs. You know, one, right. one has to wonder about the religious kind of connection with painted eggs. But anyway, yes. um, you know, oh, they're, they're, deva they're devoutly yeah. religious. That's the problem. They're yeah. devoutly Orthodox Christian, which is why they are so anti-Semitic. I mean, they're, when you realize that the population of Jews has gone from 6% to two-tenths of 1% of the population over the uh, the last uh, uh, less than 100 years, you've got a serious, serious problem with those people's morality. Well, yeah. Well, then, well they also took a, a serious hit when Stalin killed off tens of millions of Christians, too. Um, you know, he, you know, Stalin was not exactly kind. So yes, Ukraine has, a, a, you know, has, you know, a very spotty history in numerous ways. You know, and with much yes. violence, they yeah. got stiffed on. They're very terribly stiffed with the radiation from Chernobyl, and now, yeah. you know, the the European Union wants to squeeze them like an orange. Yeah, you know? but look at you know, the Ukraine uh, when it was under the czars. You know, they they revolted too. They didn't want to be under those terrible czars. But when they were under the czars. They had a, a, a vibrant economy, and then they went uh, under the control of communism for uh, all of those years, starting with Lenin and with Stalin, and their economic prosperity dwindled to the point that it was essentially uh, nothing. That's the world we live in. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. Uh, Ukraine is not the only place uh, where the world is uh, is burning and there is economic unheaval, uh, upheaval. Uh, Reuters is reporting that a female student and a uh, and a young supermarket worker with the latest fatalities in Venezuela's political unrest, the death toll from uh, ten days of violence. Both sides are mourning supporters killed uh, in the worst ter uh, turmoil since uh, the. Current president nearly won election in April of last year. He replaced the socialist Hugo Chavez. It's an extraordinarily difficult situation when a country uh, turns uh, socialistic, as America has uh, turned, as uh, many countries uh, throughout Europe have turned. When they turn socialistic, they create the dependency economy, and that economy that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't matter where it's tried, it fails. And so with the, with the socialist, communist, economic uh, program just causing people to become dependent, uh, ultimately it collapses, just as uh, did the Soviet Union. And it's very difficult then for a country to, to reestablish itself, to uh, instill in its people uh, personal responsibility, uh, the sense of, of making a contribution. Uh, as opposed to being taken care of. And so the government now is blaming fascist groups for seeking a coup, uh, like the one that briefly ousted uh, Chavez uh, 12 years ago. But, you know, with a fascist government, uh, that's what Russia replaced communism with, a fascist government is maybe the only means out of, uh, of the failed socialist economic uh, 
uh, strategy. But the people uh, don't fare any better under a fascist government than they do under a socialist one. Uh, the elite do, but the people don't. And yet, this is what we're beginning to witness around the world, and it's going to come home to roost in Europe and in the United States. Uh, you look at uh, not only do we have unrest in, in Venezuela, but uh, the economy is failing again in Argentina. So this is a trend that the world is going to need to deal with. Speaking of uh, ongoing trends, another 17 people were killed today uh, in Iraq, uh, both from uh, suicide bombings, uh, from uh, uh, assassination shootings, and also from stabbings. It has become a country where the most prevalent behavior is, the, is acts of terrorism by its population. Speaking of terrorism... Gunmen from uh, Nigeria's Boko Haram Islamist group um, raided a uh, a town, opening fire on a school, uh, shooting and uh, burning to death 47 people last week. 47 people burned alive. The death toll was confirmed uh, by uh, the police commissioner, and uh, there are at least 10 badly wounded and burned for each of the 47 that were killed. There was shooting everywhere, according to uh, this quote. Uh, they set uh, the buildings ablaze. They made certain that no one could escape. Many died. And the schools that were set ablaze by Boko Haram, the Islamist militant group, students tried to run for their lives, and yet uh, the when they tried to escape the burning buildings, they were shot. It was one of several days of deadly attacks during the week. On Sunday alone, the Islamists killed 106 people in one village, making it one of their deadliest assaults so far. That prompted the Borno state governor to say that the rebels were better armed and better motivated than government forces. The senseless target scene of innocent civilians is unacceptable. Oh, U.S. State Department spokesman. Uh, for Africa, Will Stevens said, well, thank you very much for uh, supplying that information, Mr. Stevens, but why is it then that the United States is supplying hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons to the Islamic world? Why did the United States provide weapons to the Libyans who are now distributing those weapons to Islamic terrorists throughout the region of northern and central Africa? Why, if that is unacceptable, Secretary Stevens, did we provide the weapons to make it possible? We encourage, uh, this is uh, Will Stevens of the U.S. State Department, said we encourage the Nigerian authorities to investigate this heinous act and to hold those responsible accountable. Now, why don't you look right at yourself in the mirror? It's your government that supplied the weapons that made this possible. If you want to know the accountable party, then look at the U.S. administration, look at the State Department, look at the U.S. military, and you will find those who are accountable, sir. more news to cover tomorrow, so I'd like to make the transition as we have uh, each of the last few weeks to the Edicts of Christianity, so we could continue to expose uh, uh, and condemn uh, this false religion. Uh, we're using the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Edicts, uh, some 24 uh, of them, as uh, our uh, means to expose and, uh, and condemn uh, Christianity. Now, uh, to some degree, um, uh, these are limited to Protestant Christians and to some degree even evangelical Protestant uh, Christians and s some of them are universal uh, the next is spiritual gifts and the ministries now this is something that you would not see much in Roman Catholicism because uh, 
the, the laity is to be fleeced and abused in Roman Catholicism. But it says, spiritual gifts and ministry. God bestows upon all members of his church in every age spiritual gifts, which each member is to employ in a loving ministry for the common good of the church and of humanity. Now, this spiritual gift stuff is, uh, is all Pauline. There is no reference of a spiritual gift other than uh, that which is Pauline. Uh, the gifts of Yahweh are all um, uh, embedded in the covenant. But they don't go beyond the covenant. So the gifts that Yahweh provides are all covenant related. Now, I should back up and say, Yahweh gave uh, humankind uh, three gifts before he, gave, he provided the gift of his covenant. Uh, and the gift of his Torah to explain the covenant, uh, but it, even those gifts were designed to operate within the purview of the covenant. They are, he gave us mortal life, he gave us uh, free will, and he gave us an asalma, which is a conscience, to be able to ascertain which is what that which is good and that which is not, that which is dependable and that which is unreliable. And so it's those three gifts that God gave to all humankind that are designed to enable us to choose to participate in the the covenant, which is the sum total of Yahweh's gift to humanity. Um, and so there are no more spiritual gifts. That's it. Now, those are pretty good gifts because there, there are five benefits of the covenant. They are eternal life. They are uh, uh, perfection so that we are vindicated and uh, perfected before God, that uh, we are adopted into his home as his children, that uh, we are enriched with his guidance and his teaching, and we are empowered by his spirit. Those are the five spiritual gifts. Full stop. Paul didn't like the Torah very much, as you probably know, and so he came up with a whole different gift uh, list of uh, of gifts, and he wrote about them. Now, the only problem is that Paul was demon possessed and insane by his own admission, by the way, and so that his gifts are all untrue. Now, beyond this, there is God doesn't bestow anything through Paul, nothing. Paul and God are foes. Paul is called the plague of death by God. So there is nothing that Paul writes that is valid. God does not have a church. There isn't anything remotely akin to a church in the Torah, Prophets, Psalms, or even in the eyewitness accounts found in the Greek text. Where you read church and an English translation of, a, of the Greek text, the underlying word is ecclesia. It's not even remotely akin to church. It is a translation of the Hebrew concept of mikra, which is an invitation to be called out and meet with God. And Christianity specifically annuls all seven of the mikra. And so since its replacement for mikra, these seven invitations to meet with God, um, Pesach, Matzah, Bakurim, Shavuah, Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah, are expressly excluded from the church's doctrine and teaching, from the church's celebration, church is completely removed from the Greek word that translated the Hebrew word that God actually said. So there is no association between the church and God. So God does not have a church. And the only individuals that God ever speaks of ministering for the common good are the Loi, uh, corrupted to Levites. Uh, Loi means to unite. And they were born into this. They, you don't choose to do it. It's not uh, ubiquitous. One of 12 tribes, and they, they were born into this role. Now, that role isn't necessarily all, you know, peaches and cream. If you were a Loi, because of this role of, of acting as judges uh, to, uh, to uh, apply the Torah's teachings in, in the people's lives and to facilitate the symbolism of each of the seven Moed Mikre, uh, these Loi, um, so that they wouldn't gain status, were prohibited from owning any land. They were prohibited from receiving money. They got leftover food, they got some wood, they got some wool, and that was it. So 
There is no ministry apart from them. Given by the agency of the Holy Spirit, there is no Holy Spirit. There is a set-apart spirit. And if you don't understand that the spirit is set apart, you don't know the spirit. Well, portions to each member as he wills, it's not he, it's she. And there's nothing these people get right. Ruach is a feminine noun in Hebrew. It, the set-apart spirit is she, and it's always described as she throughout the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. It's the maternal aspect of Yahweh's nature. And it says, as he wills, the gifts provide all abilities and ministries needed by the church to fulfill its divinely ordained functions. The church doesn't have any divinely ordained functions. It's not even divinely ordained. It has no function. It has no capacity whatsoever. It has no association with the set-apart spirit. Now, according to the scriptures, what they mean is according to Paul, who was the antithesis of scripture. Paul was not only not inspired by God, he was inspired by Satan by his own admission. These gifts include such ministries as faith. (laughs) Sorry, folks. God has no interest in faith. The whole purpose of providing his scientific evaluation of witness to creation and then his historical portrait of uh, times that have been proven valid, just as has his scientific account of creation of the flood. Beyond that, God filled his prophetic, his testimony with prophecies. And that these prophecies prove beyond any doubt that he exists as God, Yahweh, and that he authored his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And so when God proves his existence and his authorship, and who he is and what he's offering, faith becomes irrelevant. So there's no purpose for faith. Healing is the uh, is the next. God doesn't have healers. I'm sorry. Prophecy? No. You know, it's interesting that none of the people called prophets in the Hebrew Torah, Prophets, and Psalms ever once predicted the future. Not one of them. Not one, ever. Prophet was used as one who speaks for God. God predicted the future through them. They're not saying, oh boy, you know, I got this secret intel insight. I got my decoder ring here and and I'm going to use some uh, some clever clever terminology and I'm going to predict what's going to happen now, never once. God spoke through them in first person, and God said, this is what's going to happen. In a future program, we're going to spend a number of programs on Yashaya 17 and 18, which depict what's happening now in Syria and where that's going to lead the world, and particularly describe the United States and its role in this mess. It talks about the timing of the harvest, and it uh, presents what God is doing on behalf of his people. And so we will go through that, but as we go through it, recognize that Yahshua wasn't predicting the future. He wasn't acting as a prophet. He was simply communicating what God spoke directly through him in first person. There are no prophets today. None. I can share what the prophets wrote with you, but I'm not a prophet nor is anyone alive today or anyone over the the last better part of 2,000 years. As we go through here, proclamation will be one of them. It's amazing since they have this gift of proclamation and none of them can tell the truth. Almost everything they've said is incorrect. Teaching, once again, everything that they have taught here has been untrue. Administration, God hates hierarchy, despises it. Paul loved it. God hates it. With God, we are all his, when we embrace the terms and conditions of the covenant, we are all equal. We're brothers and sisters. There is no administration. Reconciliation is something man does not do, but that's on their list. It's Yahweh who reconciles his relationship with us. goes on uh, in this uh, list. The next is the gift of prophecy. Yes, this is what caused the Seventh-day Adventist church to exist in the first place. They have a false prophet. She was an extraordinarily uh, 
misguided and dark woman. And I say dark because the, the one universal characteristic of her uh, prophecies, her, her prophetic experiences, she, she would come out of them and spell D-A-R-K. She, like Paul, might have well received inspiration, but it was from the forces of darkness. Everything that she predicted, everything that she revealed, is counter to Yahweh. Here's what they say on the gift of prophecy. It's point 18. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. That is not true. There's never once where we are told that the Holy Spirit enables us to be prophets. Never once, because first of all, it's a set-apart spirit. And Yahweh has already revealed everything we need to know. You know, when we consider his revelation of the future as it relates to what's occurring in Damascus, Syria, and where that's going to lead us, there's no reason for a prophetic statement. It's all laid out for us. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. As the Lord's messenger, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. Yeah, they've got Ellen G. White as a co-author of Scripture. Yes, did you know that put Ellen G. White right next to old Paul? Yes, indeed, that's according to the beliefs of these people. Now, everything she said was wrong. It's all easily proven wrong, but that doesn't deter the faithful. Welcome back to Shattering Miss. Uh, as it relates to the gift of prophecy, um, there is no place where Yahweh uh, ever says that prophecy is a gift. Uh, Yahweh is able to be a prophet because he's actually witnessed our future. Uh, it's the nature of light, the nature of his being. He has seen our future and just simply reported our future uh, in our uh, uh, in our past. And so when, when those he speaks through uh, write down what God has told them that he has seen, they are obviously right 100% of the time because God's not predicting. He's not guessing what's going to happen. He's telling us what's going to happen because he's actually witnessed it happening in our future. Ellen White was a scam artist. Um, now, what is uh, interesting here is that uh, not only they claim that she was the Lord's messenger, which means that she was a scam artist because the Lord is Satan, according to Yahweh. They, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists say, oh, they also, these prophets, make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Now, there is a place where Yahweh provides us with a test for uh, determining whether or not somebody is a true or false prophet, whether they're speaking for him or not. He has that test in the Dabarim. The first is provided in the 13th chapter of Dabarim, which means words. It's been corrupted to Deuteronomy. And the second is uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, Dabarim, words, 18. God systematically says, all right, you're wondering. And in the future, others are going to wonder. Whether or not someone who claims to be a prophet, like Paul, is speaking for me or not. And then Yahweh delineates the way that, that we can tell for sure if somebody is speaking for him or not. Now, if you want to read those tests, they're provided in Questioning Paul. So if you go to questioningpaul.com, uh, both the dividing 13 and 18 test is provided for your consideration. Miss uh, Ellen G. White failed every condition of both tests. And it's interesting, of course, that as the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, they know that, but uh, they've got a religion to sell. So what do they do? When they cite the references as to where you could go to whether or know whether or not your prophet is telling you the truth, they um, don't cite the body. No, they cite Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation. Revelation doesn't even speak of the Bible. Acts doesn't speak of a Bible. Hebrew doesn't speak of a Bible. And Devarim speaks of God's testimony and how you could tell whether or not a prophet is true, and she failed all of those tests. Now, speaking of uh, of the Torah, 
which is uh, Yahweh's uh, source of uh, guidance to us, particularly about his covenant. And, of course, they don't even mention the covenant. Their next point, 19, is the law of God. God doesn't have any laws. Torah doesn't mean law. And regardless of how you define Torah, since it is universally discounted and annulled in Christianity, why would you even reference it? It destroys the very basis of what you believe. It's, it's, uh, it's like saying that, uh, that uh, all wagons are red when uh, the, the instruction manual shows only blue wagons. And you say, yep, yeah, we're based upon the instruction manual that says all wagons are blue, and we're now claiming that all wagons are red. It is mind-bogglingly stupid. But nonetheless, law of God is their um, point 19. They don't know his name, and they don't know that his Torah means guidance. But nonetheless, here's what they have to say. The great principles of God's law are embodied in the Ten Commandments and are exemplified in the life of Christ. Well, beyond the fact that God doesn't have any laws, his uh, ten statements, none of which are commandments, do embody what uh, God is conveying in his Torah. They are, to a, um, a degree, a bit of a summation, if you will, of, uh, of the Torah. The first thing they say is that, my name is Yahweh. And yet they don't even make the connection between Yahweh and Yahusha. Now, if you can't make that connection, you're a cooked goose as it relates to understanding what God has communicated. Even worse, they uh, then uh, say that, uh, that that first statement that God etched in stone said, I am your Savior. I'm the one who saved you. And yet they want Christ to be their Savior. It's not what the first statement says. It's the opposite of what the first statement says. And then they, the first statement says, you know, if you try to exist with a God other than me, other than Yahweh, you're going to fail. And yet, they want to exist with a, with a God named Christ. The first statement that Yahweh etched in stone completely destroys their religion. As to the second, which is an overt condemnation of religion. And God saying how fathers corrupt their sons to the third and fourth generations because of the practice of religion. We'll return to Shattering Myths after the break. <laughs> 